Hi, and welcome to or welcome back to the 2021 Canadian Women in Cybersecurity Conference from CyberX. Today, I am super excited to be moderating an amazing panel on security on the go, exploring digital IDs for travel. So digital IDs are newer to travel. We didn't always have automated things that we could do, um, but we've always had security and we've always had authentication with travel. But one interesting story I have uh, is when I first got married, they didn't update passports right away. So I had changed my last name and the passport office had actually put a sticker into my passport four pages in, but the name on the front was still my maiden name, but I was buying tickets in my married name. So just because I guess I've always been passionate about security and privacy, every time I went to the counter, I would hand over my passport and hand over my ticket with my married name and wait to see if they would actually notice. And I gotta say about 50% of the time, someone would go, hey, wait a minute, these names don't match. And then I'd say, oh yeah, sorry, I forgot, it's on page 10. But 50% of the time, they let me board the plane with a ticket, no picture, that clearly didn't match my passport. So we've always had a fundamental problem in ensuring that people are checking identities and verifying to make sure that we are getting the right people on the right place. With the advent of technology, we were able to move this forward a lot faster. And of course, with COVID, we've had all this digital transformation and we're moving things even faster. Today, we have an amazing panel of experts on identity access, management, and other privacy related topics. So I'm going to have them introduce themselves. I'd like you guys to tell us who you are, what uh, IAM has to do with your job, and your favorite mode of travel, if it's airplane or car or train or boat. So I'm going to start with Melissa. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? All right. So my name is Melissa Carvalho. I am the Vice President of Identity and Access Management at RBC. So it has everything to do with my job. I have about 200 staff. I have um, about 80,000 employees or internal users and 14 to 16 million customers that I provide solutions for all around identity and access management. I am also the Canadian ambassador for women in identity. So what is Women in Identity? Women in Identity is a not-for-profit organization that's run completely by volunteers, whose purpose it is to promote um, parity. And we really believe that digital identity solutions that are built for everyone should be built by everyone. I have 20 years of identity and access management experience. And prior to the pandemic, I was an avid traveler, traveled to 65 countries. I was trying to get to 70 last year. And so my favorite mode of transportation is the plane because I can get to places faster. Excellent. Thank you so much. Layla, why don't you go ahead? Oh, you pronounced my name perfectly right there. I think the Eric Clapton song helped, didn't it? Um, my name is Layla Draganik, and I work for TV as a senior information security analyst. And um, as opposed to Melissa, I, I don't manage anyone. So there's nobody that I am I'm making do any work. But um, what we do and what my job is, it, it's not directly re related. It's not solely focused on identity and access management. It is a big part of what we do, which is that at TD Securities, we ensure that sort of the business and the technology partners that we have can move at a good speed and that we are not preventing anyone, but we are also keeping them safe while they're doing their jobs. Now, identity and access management is important because the one thing that I have noticed, not only at TD, but also at smaller companies that I work with, is that occasionally access management is kind of 
the fastest fix when it comes to the cybersecurity controls that they have, and occasionally the most important one. Because we all know that the human factor is very often the most important one. And, and that factor acts, that if you can mitigate that, I mean, you've done so much, especially for small smaller organizations. And that is why access management is so important to me and, and knowing you know, how you're giving access to people, who is doing what, if you, can, if you can take that access away quickly. So I think it really is a linchpin of cybersecurity in certain ways. So not directly the focus of what I do, but it is a part of it. Um, and my favorite mode of transportation is I'm, I'm a car person. I love cars. I love my hybrid fuel efficient car. But, and I know that this is fuel, this is solely, solely fueled by the pandemic. I really miss the subway. So I really miss the train. And I know that this is nostalgia and I'll hate it as soon as I board the TDC, like the second time and I have to be in like a smelly compartment. I know I will, but right now the nostalgia is really fueling the TTC, um, the TTC nostalgia. Awesome, I love that answer. Adriana, go ahead, why don't you introduce yourself? Um, so my name is Adriana Viga Belovic. Um, I'm a partner and leader in the cybersecurity and privacy practice, um, professional practice at MMP. Um, I, uh, I've been in this uh, field for about uh, 20 years, both in technology and information security and privacy. Um, so why it's identity and access management important to me? Uh, for the last 15 years, my focus has been around protecting data. And uh, either through uh, things like payments and payment security, uh, through privacy and, and through Everything in between, uh, uh, now uh, we are talking about analytics and using AI. So uh, if we look at where we are going from a digital perspective, everything is more and more digital every day. The enterprise has been expanded to include people working from home, bring your own devices, multi-clouds out there. And in order to protect data and to ensure that the right people get access to the right resources, and you know, implement zero trust models like we, we talk about these days, identity becomes very important. Being able to, to know that you are who you say you are in this digital world is more important than ever. So I'm very passionate about that. Um, so in terms of, uh, of travel, I, I, love, I love travel. And um, as probably a lot of you have, have, have felt it over the last, uh, last year. Um, I have to say uh, it's been 14 months and three days since my last trip, and I'm feeling it. <laughs> and uh, my uh, uh, preferred way of travel, um, if there is a plane, I'll take it. But once I get there, what I really like to do is go by train, explore the different, uh, different uh, parts of the world by train. Fantastic. I love that everyone has a different answer. Uh, Dr. Ichos, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? So much, Kat. And actually, I was going to say I'm with Adriana for that. I will answer that first. I would go on train. <laughs> So uh, I'm Dr. Jyot Seni, and I'm the academic chair for Women in Cybersecurity Ontario Affiliate. And um, by day job, I am the assistant prof uh, in School of Computer Science and University of Windsor. And my research uh, has been in connected vehicle security and privacy. And specifically on the privacy end, I focused on the location privacy of the vehicle to vehicle communication. Um, and because of that, Somehow I'm connected with the IEM, uh, Identity Access Management. I also don't manage people like uh, Melissa, but for sure I teach students and work with the lab uh, partners, uh, run the industry and uh, uh, also in the academia. So my work is on the location privacy. So I will try to connect dots with the security architecture and privacy by design principles. Fantastic. Uh, and I'm Kat Code. I'm a data privacy consultant. Um, and although I'm also missing travel, I do not miss restaurants. I do miss travel though. <laughs> uh, I could probably take an RV right now um, and go off into the wilderness and live in an RV. All right, so we're gonna get started. Um, given most of what we're talking about is, is crossing borders and that's where digital identity seems to come in. We have a lot of touchless interactions are being pushed right now, um, especially with COVID and we're looking at biometrics. So we know Nexus uses eyeball scans. There's other proposed um, biometrics with facial identity and, and other, um, other kinds of scans that we could do. So what are the top 
security questions that come to mind with using biometrics to do identity management? Why don't we start, Melissa, with you? So I think about two areas. The first one is um, diversity and inclusion. It's not necessarily primarily security, but if we go back to 2019, the UK issued biometric passports and guess what? They didn't work for people of color, primarily women of color. Um, in New Zealand, around a similar uh, period of time, we had registration systems that didn't work for certain facial features. And while that might be a frustrating user experience and it turns people away, think about what the bad actors can do in those situations. Think about all the vulnerabilities that can be exploited. And so that's one area I think about when I think about these technologies. Uh, a second area I think about is where do they store this information? Who do they share this information with? What are the security concerns? Now, being an identity, I'm a big proponent of pushing forward with innovation, especially in biometrics um, in those areas, because user IDs and passwords aren't the best way to go, especially for other groups where um, you have younger kids and you're thinking about virtualizing service for them. How do they log in and re register? Um, patients with um, dementia, how do they register? And so uh, I'm a big proponent of it. It's just that we have to think about all the considerations. And so we really have to test our solutions, look beyond our typical um, user community when we're doing that. Excellent. Layla, what do you think? Uh, what, what Melissa just said really resonated with me. And, and the most important part is how she kind of touched upon both the political and, and social aspect of it, but also the technological aspect. And I know we're going to talk about some of the human rights issues and, and social issues later on, but primarily security, the, the, the one issue is that you are putting everything in one place. There is a risk now. The push that, that I've seen from, for example, the government of Ontario is that we're going to create one digital ID and you have all of your information in there, right? And you use it for everything from travel to getting carded in a bar, right? Everything's in there, your tax information, your health information, all of it. And when we are discussing these things, and as Melissa said, we're not, we're not against innovation, but we really need to be careful as we are moving forward with this innovation. I know that we all want the convenience of that digital ID. I mean, who doesn't want to just, you know, speed through an airport, not have to do everything that you need to do, who, who doesn't want to wait in line, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be careful about it. And my primary security concern is exactly that, that we are putting everything in one place. So you suddenly have from like a couple of threat surfaces, you're suddenly putting everything on the kind of one small honeypot, where if that is not guarded properly, you have people's information and these are people's lives available to threat actors. And we really don't want that. And we don't want to rush into that process. Because what comes out of that when we are when you have everything in one space, you need to think about, you know, is this information properly encrypted? Who has access to these cryptographic keys? Who is generating them? Is this going to be encrypted at rest? Is this going to be encrypted in transit? Um, who can read it at which point? And you also need to think about sort of the organizations that are doing this. And I know that we were, we, there was a really great session that this conference had on working from home and security and how we've seen an increase now in attacks on health institutions, which makes perfect sense. Now, I don't know if anybody else does this. I do it. I have, a, I have a slight professional deformation, which means that if I'm in a government institution or a health institution, I will take a peek at the computer to see what kind of software they're using to see if it's up to date, if it's modern or not. And more often than not, in government institutions and large health institutions, it's going to be, it's not going to be great. It's usually, they don't, they're not the best at innovating quickly. They're not the best at implementing cybersecurity measures quickly again. They tend to lag a little bit. So I like to call them dinosaurs, not because they're old, but just because they're so huge. So putting the security measures in place that you need to put takes a little bit of time. And if we are putting out these digital IDs that are being managed by these huge institutions, are they going to be quick enough to put these cybersecurity controls in place? So those are, those are two of my concerns. I have many more, but I'm going to let the rest of the panel speak. Excellent. Adriana? Well, I think I will add two, two uh, things to it. So one, I think uh, while uh, we want to, to use innovation uh, to, to get to do travel faster and more convenient, uh, we also have to think about what, what are we talking about here is our biometrics. So we only have one chance to get it right because we can't replace the passport. We can't replace the password. It's our face, it's our eyes, it's our biometrics. We can change those. So uh, we really have to, to be careful how we do it. 
um, to, to ensure the trust of, of the citizens, to ensure that you know, going forward, they will be, um, there will be protection of that data. And then the second one, um, you know, we talked about different, um, different countries taking different approaches on how they are gonna implement these solutions. So now think about uh, every country has its own standards. Us starting to share that information across the globe because we all like to travel around the globe. <laughs> uh, who do we give that information uh, to? What standards those, uh, uh, those countries or organizations or airlines that we might be taking will, uh, will uh, use to protect our information? And maybe the third one I will add is we are using so many different technologies. Uh, we all have our own devices. These devices, they are all, not all created equal. There are so many applications and we have seen a flurry of applications coming to the market in the last year uh, to deal with, with this kind of uh, uh, issues. So how, how do we ensure that those applications, those devices have security and privacy by design embedded in them? To, to ensure that trust. And, and really, I, I think that trust is gonna be um, the main thing that we have to, to focus on. Because remember, we have to trust that whoever says it is in the digital world is actually that person. Excellent, Dr. Ikja, do you wanna add to that? Yeah, actually, Adriana, you just weaved into uh, what I was going to say and also just uh, stolen my one of the points I was going to mention about uh, the standards in the different countries, because we are going to see more and more people calling themselves as global citizens. And a lot of traveling is happening already, not now, but in this world. Uh, and we, were, we are going to see that more and more happen. So when, once that's going to be there, so as you mentioned, trust just putting a digital ID, we just zoom and we have to assume because that's the model it is. Um, so we, what we now need to do because each country, every country has their own standards. So we, it's not like technically we cannot do it, digital identification, but we, we could actually do it, but it's the legislation, policy making, regulations, which are stopping it. And especially with the global citizenship idea, I think it's gonna be, uh, very game changing, but it's going to take a push from the other side on the legislation and how do you want to regulate it uh, when you're crossing borders and does it make sense um, when, when that's happening uh, to both the countries and there is a trust factor there. But what, what is important from technical point of view and I think I'm weaving into what M Melissa already mentioned, um, I believe that it's the life cycle um, issue that it's one thing to have the collection of data and then it's very, very important to know how that is being stored and where it's being used and when it's being deleted. These three things I think is very, are very important. And the last one we always miss, where the data is lying uh, right now, we don't know it, where it resides and when it's being deleted. I think it's the focus always have been pivotal in okay, we want to collect data, analyze it, but nobody mentioned about, okay, we want to delete it and curate the data and remove it because it's sensitive information. And Adriana has mentioned that very clearly, it's very sensitive information. And one time you have just one chance. Yeah, Fantastic. so there's a lot. Just want to mention that it's the life cycle that technically the innovation needs to be done on that front. That's the entire life cycle should be considered, not just a digital ID as a model itself. Yeah, for all, I mean, for all sensitive information, but definitely. Um, I just wanted to say quickly, if you are watching live, if you want to drop questions into the chat, we will answer them as we go. Uh, so I am hearing four different problems from four different people. <laughs> I'm hearing that the technology is not accurate, um, certainly for people of color, but also uh, facial recognition is also very much based on two eyes and a nose and a mouth. And anyone who has facial tattoos and sc severe scarring or anything on their face that might be unique or different, um, that's going to affect it. So the technology's not there. Um, I'm hearing that the security isn't there <laughs> because we're launching faster than we have it. Um, I'm hearing that it is a unique piece of data and we like this isn't a new credit card number that you can apply for because once your biometrics gone, it's gone. And I'm hearing, of course, this is a, a data governance and management issue that people might not be considering because they're collecting this all the way through. So actually we did have a question that came in. So to follow that, I don't know anyone can jump in on this one. Um, is there a role for blockchain in securing um, the, this whole thing? Um, 
in terms of all of this information or, or even the transportation and people movement? I don't know if anyone, Layla, I, do you want to jump in on that? <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I will say that the blockchain, you know, if, if you're if you're reading the materials around digital IDs, you will see that very often blockchain is kind of, it, it's, it's viewed almost as a panacea to this issue. And everybody's kind of speaking about putting this information on, on the blockchain, right? So that, because what, but what they are trying to solve when they are saying this is that they are trying to decentralize the information. And that is, I know that we posed a lot of questions and we mentioned a lot of problems. And this, this is one of the solutions. One of the solutions is to ensure that your data is decentralized, that it is not in, in only one database or that it is not located in only one spot. So blockchain would fix that in the sense that it is fully decentralized. It would fix that in the sense that nobody can really tamper with it because you can tamper with information that's in there. And I have seen companies like, and I'm only name checking them because they're doing something good it seems, uh, Airside that has been working with American Airlines, they have a decentralized system and are striving to move their system onto blockchain. Excellent. Does anyone else have, Adriana? I, I have another another view as well, because with, with blockchain, you introduce other issues. Uh, you, you introduce the fact that you cannot take the data out from the blockchain. So then how do you implement privacy regulations? So it, it comes to the point of uh, thinking, okay, what data could be going on the blockchain versus what data shouldn't be going on the blockchain. But I think one of the things that the blockchain can, can solve, and we have seen some solutions already in the market these days, is how do you ensure that data is, uh, is not moving so much? We don't create so many copies. And it comes back with that trust. Uh, so you have all the requests on the blockchain. So you know who accessed what data. You can anonymize who made the request, who provided the data, but the data doesn't move as much. So then you, you, you stop the proliferation of data. And then with that, the, the need for putting security and privacy controls around it. So I think there is a, a, a role for blockchain to, to play in the, in the future of identity. Excellent. All right, so we're we're talking about all of this data being put together. Certainly, with the pandemic and travel, the part and parcel will be the vaccinations. So we're we might have this ability to add some kind of vaccination information to digital identity to ensure people have been vaccinated to cross borders. And then, if we're doing this for COVID, where does the stop? Because there was issues in the United States where there was the anti-vax militia, still is an anti-vax movement. <laughs> And, uh, and they were talking about um, some places not allowing in uh, children who hadn't been vaccinated. So um, thoughts about how should this information be included in uh, with your identity? Uh, and are, are we going kind of too far with this? Adriana, why don't we start with you? Uh, <laughs> very interesting uh, stories because I, I worked on two applications uh, uh, around COVID <laughs> recently. And... Uh, I, what I think is we have to think differently. So how are we going to use this data? What models we are going to use? Uh, how do we make sure that we, we uh, meet the intent of making sure that people are vaccinated before they, they, and they board the plane, but not taking that data away from, from somewhere? So how do you use, and I, I, I was uh, reading, you know, maybe it's a QR code with uh, back end that does the verification and uh, you read that data that I have had the proof that I had the vaccine, but nobody can take that data away from my device. So we have to come up with very innovative ways of providing that information at a point of check where we need to do it, but in such a way that that data doesn't, doesn't go anywhere. So you still have, as a, as a citizen, you still have control over that data. Hey, Chat, do you have anything to add to that one? Yeah, I would just say it's the control measures that needs to be put in place uh, rather than thinking that the, uh, the way that Adriana has mentioned, I think it's very neat. Uh, you're not uh, letting the information just uh, be in hands of everyone and there is no passive uh, authentication issue. Actually, it's a passive authentication, no active authentication where you can actually see the information, right, and retrieve it. So I think that's pretty neat and uh, that would be one of the ways I think there is there there would be many ways uh, going forward. All right, Melissa. 
Oh, so I'm going to take a different spin on this and just look at it slightly differently. So when I registered a family member the other day for the vaccination, I had to provide um, proof of a health card, at least in Canada. I had to provide proof of address. I had to then, when they go to the appointment, they have to pr provide proof of identity. And when I think about that, I think, why are we always linking the vaccine to the identity? And it sounds strange to say that, but what about people who don't have a permanent address or a home? How do they get vaccinated? What about um, individuals who don't have a health card? They might be undocumented. They might be in the country for a short period of time and not yet have a health card. Are they not entitled to get vaccinated? Uh, I think about the transgender community. If they're in the process of transitioning, when you go to show your identity, um, how do you validate that identity? And so I think about the two together and then I, you add the complexity of travel onto that. And I think, how do you do it from one geography to another geography? How do you validate all that information? Um, so that, that's a really big concern for me because we should um, be able to vaccinate all individuals. And it, it, there's a flip side of that. Well, you want to ensure that those over 80 get vaccinated first, the, the first responders. And so how do you do that when you don't link it to the identity? Then on top of all of that, when you look at the news and the media and you think about things like cert certificates or an immunity passport, you see all these options where you can just go and buy it without actually getting vaccinated. So there's all these fakes out there where um, you can now just buy your vaccination certificate and not necessarily actually be vaccinated. So there's a lot of things that are just rushing into the space. And so Layla, I agree with you. We do need to take our time and we need to focus, but it seems like the industry and the world is just gonna move without us. And so we really all need to work together and combine our forces and our ideas to be able to provide solutions. Excellent. I do know there was a story in Toronto where somebody tried to board a plane um, with a proof of vaccination and the proof of vaccination turned out to be faked. Um, it wasn't a bot. Well, I don't know where he got it from or how he made it. But uh, yeah, so that is that is certainly a problem. And I think we could launch an entire separate session on the need for gender and identity and why it's completely irrelevant and should probably be removed from identity entirely. Uh, so I, uh, Layla, what about you? What about this whole medic vaccination thing? So all of these are really, really good points. I think what I'm going to say feeds well into it is that there's a need here for data segregation, because if you think about it, okay, if you think about it at the surface, it sounds like, okay, you know, we're going to have a QR code, says we're vaccinated or not, perfect. They want to include, and when I say they, I mean different companies, I mean different governments, want to include a lot of information on this ID in order to enable travelers to do touchless traveling, essentially, right? Which sounds great. But where does this stop? And I think Adriana asked that question, kind of where does this information stop? Because, okay, we say we're vaccinated, that's fine. Is, are they going to pull up any other health information with that just because it complements the vaccination information? What about people who can get vaccinated? I have people in my family who can because they have allergies. So is that going to have to be included as an excuse as to why they didn't get vaccinated? So how is that linked? And I think that what we need to be better at as an industry and what needs to, to, to follow this innovation, as Melissa said, is also a lot of transparency. And my concern also is, is always knowing how is this data speaking to other applications? How is this data speaking to other platforms? Where is it being pulled from? Because that is one of the issues that we're seeing with social media and now this incredibly interconnected world that even us in the industry are struggling to keep up with. So what is happening in the background there? And the one thing that I, one solution that I think can help is data segregation. And remember when we talked about kind of having one digital ID that you go to take to a bar and you travel with. I think that the solutions that are being built, you know, if I'm showing that, that like bartender my age, what, what that application that he's using is reading from my digital ID should only be my age and a simple yes or no question, rather than whatever this portal or terminal that they have is reading out everything. And that's going to be an important principle to have there and it feeds into the life cycle that Ikjot was mentioning that it, it shouldn't all be in there all the time. It needs to be deleted. How long is this going to be in these devices? Um, how is it going to be shared? So we need to think about every single aspect of the life cycle, as well as data minimization as we're doing this. Do we really, really need all of this information in one place? That was great. And you know what you touched on, which I love, is just-in-time access, too. Uh, so it's just-in-time access, and it's access only to the information you need. And I think some people are like, well, digital is going to have too much. But imagine if you had a way at the bar, as you said, where you scanned something, and the only piece of information that came up is, yes, this person's over 19, or no, they're not. Uh, you don't even need the birthday, right? You just need confirmation on that 
on that aspect. So yeah, there are definitely pros to be able to do that and only get the amount of information that you need. Um, Iktra, you had touched at the beginning on geographies and certainly all the different geographies have different reasons to collect different data and different governments have different access to that data um, and different wants of that data. So how do we make a global service for identity access management that would work for travel? Yeah, actually, you just asked the question. I wanted to just add on to what Lela was saying. So it's the context, I think, uh, that needs to be very clearly mentioned. And I think Adriana also mentioned about that. And once we have the context uh, set for each one of uh, these pieces of information that we are collecting, and then re regulate and harmonize among different countries that we are going to use this information. So you, I usually say that if there is a standard, you have to comply, be compliance with that, but it's different thing if you're putting them in controls and actually implementing it. And there are two different things to do it. And the first one is uh, once we have this con contact set, then I think there would be more agreements based on the harmonization. There would be more talks and discussions, but if we, that would be the first step that I can see that what context this information will be used and to what extent it will be used. And the, what you just mentioned, different use cases we can have, like going to the bar and then showing only that piece of information. I think it would, and it would be more informative in uh, context filtering way so that it's easier to get that. And then once we are harmonizing, I think it would make more sense if we will have small use cases and then moving forward, there will be uh, more harmonization, but it has to step uh, up to the context, I guess. That's, uh, that's how I see this, yeah. All right, Melissa, did you want to add to that? I'm not sure that we're ever going to get to a great global for every country that's out there a solution. If we just think about simple things like our passports today and how we use them, or even just the, the fact that vaccinations came out in some countries have more than others, um, we don't really share well across one ge geographic region to another. So that, that's one concern. I, you know, I when we, we thought about talking about this, I brought out my little yellow fever card and my vaccination card. And I did it because I recalled that when, um, you know, vaccinations into certain countries is not new. It's just that the pandemic has hit us globally. But I thought about traveling across the border from one country to another with my yellow fever vaccination. And for all the individual new, I could have just stamped it. I didn't even have it open to the page. I just had a yellow card and they waved me through. So when you think about that, what are all the different borders and all the different countries gonna do? How are they validating what everybody issues? How do they have that? Are they experts in doing it? In many cases, um, they might be students or people who don't have the training to do it. And so when we think of solutions like this, we have to think about um, the means of each of the countries that we're talking about, uh, the regulations set forth in those countries and simplify the solution. If we make it too complicated, I don't know that it's gonna be implemented properly. I love that point, we do not share well. <laughs> It's no, there is no global anything right now that is, you know, I can't think of a single universal service product, anything that everyone uses the same way with the same reason. So um, that's an excellent point. Uh, Leila, and Adrian, to add, add, uh, add one other thing uh, uh, there because we were talking about not sharing well. So obviously we'll need uh, some trust models between different countries. And if, uh, um, you know, implementing security around the world is any indication of how uh, well those trust models work uh, and, you know, just trying to, to uh, uh, find somebody who has done a, one of the big breaches and uh, identify them and then uh, bring them to justice uh, from different countries of the world doesn't work very well today. So <laughs> building those trust models that will allow us to, um, to trust that, you know, between the countries and have the same ways of looking at things, I, I think that's going to be very difficult. And I, I was involved with digital ID in, uh, in Canada with DIARC at uh, one point. And what we noticed, even in countries like Canada, where we have the provinces in charge of issuing IDs, it's very difficult, just the provinces to, to get together and agree on the same standards and the same way of doing things. So now expand that to the, to the global environment and how do you get that agreement? So I think it's gonna be uh, very difficult to get to that global citizen. We all hope we can get there, but it will be a great difficulty uh, to, to achieve.
I agree. In the 10 provinces and three territories, we have 10 or 13 different privacy legislations for public service and then another 13 different health legislation. So yeah, Leila, you were going to add to that? Um, I was going to add to this diversity of, of you know, borders and countries and everything. There's another issue that we could potentially see and it, we, all, we are already seeing, which is that a lot of these solutions and these terminals that are actually reading the cards are coming from private companies. So they're coming from the private sector and they're, they're, we could be in a situation right now because everybody is trying to monetize you know, the pandemic that we are seeing too many companies jumping in on this. And because we don't have this global standard, that is an added problem and something that could put people in danger because I, governments are not going to be manufacturing these terminals and they're going to be contracting it out. And there was, I think, two years ago that the Customs and Border Authority of the US, they, they, they were breached, but their contractor was breached and there were 100,000 licenses and IDs on their computer. So we also have to think about that and how that's going to add to this entire global dynamic. Um, and once we do provide those solutions to border authorities, there's a political aspect and human rights aspect to it of, well, are they going to be racist? Are they going to be biased? So if they if they have these terminals and they can read all this information, can read somebody's either health history or their or their travel history, is this going to impact their decisions because they have everything there? And this feeds back into the, the kind of data segregation, data minimization principle we were discussing before. Oh, okay, so we did have a question came in, which is great. And somebody had asked if there's any consideration for solutions where individuals could control the data they wish to share electronically. Uh, and, and could we put the choice back in the individual's hands the way we do with other privacy issues? Maybe I'll jump in just there. I won't plug any one product, but I think that's a growing trend where I own my own identity. And then we federate out and we only give uh, providers and other solutions, just the bare minimum what they need, but we control our own identity. Because the reality is we are digitizing most of our services and it, it's a horrible thing to think if I'm just one person that when I go to the grocery store, I need to have one identity. And then when I go to get a hotel, it's a different one. And then my bank, it's a different one. So you want to be able to retain your own identity, but you only want each of these services to have just the bare minimum to be able to interact with them. Excellent. All right, so we had touched on this a little bit, um, but digital IDs in general, uh, could this, and similar innovations, could this have the potential to make travel more inaccessible for some marginalized groups? Uh, Layla, why don't you start with that one? Oh boy, I could rant about this for a very long time. I think Melissa's going to help me here as well. Um, well, what I was thinking about when we were talking about security, I was going to plug this in earlier, is how are we actioning these IDs? When we're speaking about these terminals, where we're talking about facial recognition and biometrics, there is a difference that we need to know here if, if this is going to be a situation where, for example, now when you're entering the US, you go, you stop there to take a photo of your face and you're fine. But is this going to be a situation where we're moving into an environment where you're constantly being scanned, where you're constantly being surveilled and tracked? So that's one thing to think about. And another is, to answer your question in a very short manner, is that yes, this will make travel inaccessible to marginalized groups if this is mandatory. If digital IDs are mandatory, I mean, that is that would be a direct kind of slap in the face of marginalized groups and kind of a direct ultimatum that you have to have this. And by doing that, you are giving, you're giving a speed boost to people who are already ahead. And what I mean by that is that, Technology itself is inherently biased, is inherently discriminatory, because it, people who are struggling and who are poor cannot really afford the newest devices, new security, you know, that good antivirus product. So cybersecurity and technology are inherently discriminatory. Um, and not only, we know who people who are in poverty are. It's BIPOC folks, it's queer folks, and it's women. So it's very clear who will be able to very quickly jump onto this digital ID train, use the devices, use the software, have the resources to know how to do that, and have the access to them. So, so that's an immediate obstacle right there. And another one is age. We're seeing this for our families. You know, I can I can book the latest deals and flights and you know get hotels easily. My my parents can't, my grandparents can't. So there's an age barrier right there. So what we need to make sure is that this is not mandatory. 
because we're, we're putting elderly folks in danger right there. And we're making it more difficult for them to do anything. We're putting BIPOC folks in danger because not only do we know that they are the ones who are the majority in poverty, there's also a mistrust there of government institutions and they have the perfect right to be absolutely distrustful of them. And that's true. And they don't want to give their identities that easily because there's a history there of trauma and misuse. So you are, but as long as it's not mandatory, we can make this work. But once we are creating these systems, we need to understand that things are not black and white. And when designing them, we need to think about these nuances because the devil is going to be in the details. And we are giving privilege to those who are already privileged and kind of pushing them ahead a little bit. And I would caution everyone and kind of remind everyone in this field of that responsibility to not think about absolutes and kind of completely favoring one group, but thinking about these ways that we manage to put those who are already ahead, more ahead by doing small things. Maybe I, could just, I could just add to that. Um, you know, when I think about bias, I think that we all have biases and it's mainly because of our experience as well. I really only know what I read or what I experienced myself. And so when I think about systems that are being built, we code those biases into the systems. If we hire people and we all work with people who look like us and think like us, and we get into that group think mentality. And so we all end up building that into the technologies we have. Uh, and I think we have to get very creative on how we do things. Offer testing to other groups. They might not need to report to us or work with us, but start testing our solutions, uh, start making them more accessible. I think that's the only way to move this forward because the reality is we are going to digitize um, as many things as we possibly can. We are moving forward. And so if we don't all get together and start working on being the solution, uh, we will continue to have these problems. And I just wanted to, to pick on what you, you were just saying, Melissa, uh, because I'm working in quite a bit these days around machine learning and AI solutions. And what is really important is to have the right people at that table. Uh, because you, know, you have data scientists and engineers looking at the data from their own perspective. So I find that a lot of times when I come to the table and I start asking them questions around what data sets are you planning on using? Are they representative for the clients that, or for how the intent of this model to be used? Are you introducing any biases? I realize that you know most most times they haven't even thought about it. So I think is uh, getting to the point where we say, okay, we we need uh, not just diversity in terms of who participates, uh, men and women and different groups, but also diversity of of knowledge to come to the table. Uh, you need to bring the identity person, the privacy person, the security person there to the table to all bring different different perspectives and ask questions because you know we we can come up with great innovation if we are asking the right questions if we are bringing the right things to the table so here's here's the question that that we probably don't have an answer to but if there was a magical group on the globe that would solve this problem is this under the united nations like how do we solve a global problem. Is this academics? Where, who would solve this? So I can talk from academia that it's not only academics who can do it. And I always push it so much that we want to work together with the industry and also with the, reg that's why I always mention the regulators and policymakers, because those are the people, because if the lifetime of some, for some of the solution, and when you deploy them, and from the beginning, from the inception of the solution, it's longer. And during that time, if you're talking with the regulators and policymakers, I think that would make really more sense and uh, it would be more feasible. Plus it will also give you a chance to have the pilots with the people who are you working uh, for or actually building the solution for. And I think it's the equitable solutions that we lo should look forward to and to bring the frameworks and always push the questions of the, how much equitable solutions uh, or equity does this provide or not. I will say uh, that collaboration is key. Uh, you, you have to bring everybody to the table uh, to, to get the right results, but also uh, because we, we talked about here, if there are no, uh, no standards and no rules, technology is gonna move forward without us. So we have to be able to be agile and, and uh, make decisions on the fly and get to the best results. 
because we can't wait for governments to agree that we are going to have the same standards everywhere. And because we said, you know, this information is very, uh, very sensitive and we can't replace it. We have to get it right. I will say, I will say this, we, we kind of know where the gap is, right? We know what the issue is. We know who is not being represented. So I don't necessarily have an answer as to whether these are academics or this is industry or this is government. But what I do know is that we need women at that table. We need black women. We need women of color. We need indigenous women and we knew we need queer folks and we need two spirit folks and everybody to be represented there and give their voice because we know who has been kind of left behind in these discussions and we know who is being discriminated against by AI they can't read black faces and, and and people of color right so we know who needs to be brought to that table now it just comes down to the willingness to acknowledge this and actually do it and then from a political perspective where would refugees fall in this no one has the answer. <laughs> so, you know, I'll, I'll answer your previous question, at least for me. I wouldn't want any one group to be leading this charge. I think that it takes one person to make a difference. And even just in this session, I've brought in my perspective and I've learned more. And so um, I think we need to encourage just more collaboration and more working together uh, out there. I, I do agree from a refugee perspective, from a, 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 a you know, socioeconomic perspective, we need to think about those things as well. And so I think that as the technologies go out there and people get frustrated, you will find those voices um, coming out and speaking up about it. And it's up to us, as Adriana said, to be agile in our approach and how we operate um, moving forward. So we, we've talked a little bit, we've talked about biometrics. There was mention of having information on your phone. Um, I think it was Layla, you'd mentioned a card potentially. So if, if we were looking for a technological solution that you could have some, again, we're all like multi-factor authenticating here. It's something you are, something you have, something you know. Um, is there an answer that would meet the needs of marginalized communities? Like if it were a physical card that you scanned in a machine instead of having an app on your phone, would that include more people? Like, is there a technical solution to this that might make more sense? I don't think there's one solution. <laughs> I think that when you look at um, the different marginalized groups out there, there's different flavors of that. And so we need to make sure that we have many solutions and they're all interoperable with each other. All right, so we have a number of different privacy regulations now in the world. They all conflict with each other. Many of them conflict with each other, but we certainly have GDPR in Europe um, that has the right to be forgotten. And uh, CCPA in California has the same right and Bill C-11 in Canada, we are introducing that same thing. So, so essentially an individual can approach an organization and say, I would like you to remove all the data relating to me um, from within your databases. Now that should apply to consumers because that's where all of those regulations sit as a consumer perspective. But is, again, we talked about, is this industry, is it government? We don't know. So Adriana, would, do you think any of these individual rights will apply um, if we move in this direction? I think, I think overall we need to, to take a balanced approach between uh, providing convenience to the consumer, but also uh, providing freedom to choose. And Melissa uh, mentioned uh, in one of the previous questions, what information do I share with whom? Uh, so I still have that control as a, as a citizen over my, my information. And uh, uh, the other thing that we need to consider is maybe as we develop these solutions, uh, how do we ensure that we don't proliferate the data? So we can get to the point where we can ask for that data to be, to be uh, removed. But also, if I do have control over my data myself, it's going to be easier to maintain that, uh, that legislation uh, than if I give it away and then I don't know where it goes. Uh, so uh, also what, what I think is very important is customers, uh, like a lot of uh, studies recently said that the customers are likely to share their information. They do want the services. And they, but at the same time, there is a lot more awareness on what their rights are as related to privacy. So they expect, and especially the new generation, expect that privacy is actually embedded in the solutions. And I think the customers are the ones that are gonna drive this with organizations who are building the solutions for the future, because they are gonna demand that the privacy is embedded in the solutions. 
And we, we talked about international collaboration and the need for, for standards. So we have so many different privacy legislations today. So for a, for a technology co a company to be able to uh, uh, address all the legislations around the world, uh, it's a very complex undertaking. So I think we need to look at where, where we are gonna go. <laughs> Is it the GDPR gonna be the standard that we are all gonna go towards or maybe something else um, to, to allow us to actually build solutions that will, uh, will protect uh, travelers' rights. So on the flip side of the safety, um, every spy movie I've ever seen has someone with like 10 passports in their, under their bed with 10 different images. Um, so somebody did ask if, if the IDs can be used to spoof or conduct fraud, but then conversely, would cyber criminals also be able to create multiple versions of these IDs? Like how are we securing to make sure one ID belongs to one individual? I'm sure they'll find a way. Like that is that isn't a question of if it's a question of when, uh, and and that's that's also a part of it, right? When we're developing this, we need to realize, oh, this is probably going to happen. So if you're if you're building any system and you're thinking this can't get hacked or you know this won't get hacked and this is bulletproof, you already lost, and you probably already have somebody in your systems if that's how you're building it. So there absolutely is a way to to do it, and I'm sure that they will find it sooner rather than later. Um, but I, I don't have, I don't think I have the expertise to answer it uh, as much as the other panelists do. I think I would agree. I think it's um, inevitable. It's going to happen um, if it not hasn't already happened in so many solutions that are issued today. And I think what we need to um, get better at doing is not only having that preventative kind of control, but the detective controls out there, figure out when it is occurring and then how we're going to react to it. Uh, the reality is most organizations are breached on a regular basis and it's how they react and how they handle it. Um, that's one of the most important things for, for our customers. And I, sec I second that. I mean, being prepared, uh, it's uh, half of the battle. <laughs> when you, you win the, the battle half if you, if you are prepared and you are expecting it. And with more digitization, it's only likely that we are going to see more attacks and more innovation <laughs> from that perspective as well on how to uh, uh, circumvent the controls that we put in place. And as, as Adriana said, you know, your face is your face and your, your irises are, are your irises. So we are one data breach away from this happening because you just need one of these companies, one of these many companies that might be developing the terminals or whatever they are, one of them needs to be breached. Your face is out there, your fingerprints are out there. And then, you know, you can have the, the 15 identities, as you mentioned, Kat, with, um, with spies and everyone running around. So... And I don't know if anyone can speak to this, just to explain it to people who are who are watching that may not understand this, that our biometrics kept as they are, it's not an image, it's a it's a set of data, and then it can be a set of hash data so that it, it can't be duplicated. So I don't know if anyone can explain that technology easily so people understand what that means. I think you didn't get enough job explaining it from a simple <laughs> term. I'm not sure how I can simplify it even more, but um, there, are, there are different methods to store it um, we're coming up with different technologies every day, but I think you did an amazing job just to simplifying it. And no fear people are saying, well, you've got a picture of my face. And it's like, that's, that's not what, I mean, that, that is what Facebook's doing, but that's not necessarily what um, this technology would do. Uh, so somebody else asked, and we do have a few minutes. So if other people have questions, please pop them into the chat and we'll get to them. Someone else asked, if we move to digital IDs, does this create a new threat with physical IDs? Uh, especially if the physical IDs aren't disposed of properly. I think it could create a new threat. Uh, I think anything is possible. Um, I'm not necessarily, I don't have the mind of a hacker, and so I can't really uh, comment on that easily, but uh, I can foresee cases where that could create other threats and other opportunities. Um, not necessarily a talk on all the ways you can attack or break into things, but um, I definitely can see those opportunities existing. I can actually talk about this, but not in sense of physical ID itself, but I can tell that the work that I was, I've been doing for research was based on not using the vehicle identification number, uh, but rather using a temporary identifier, like a pseudonymous identification uh, for identifying the vehicle and then having all the information, like 
communication done based on that temporary identifier. But that raises a completely new set of threat landscape. Now you have on the handling uh, this new communication set, you need a different kind of PKI system because now you have introduced a temporary identifier, which is mapping to this original uh, vehicle. And then this is creating a new set of problems. And I think this can be the work uh, in the, it is called security credential management system for V2X uh, communication. And I think this could be a little bit uh, touching what we are discussing here, like digital identification. And it has like so many radical structure uh, differences than we have in the PKI itself. So I think, uh, in the management, I think it would change completely the way we handle physical identification today. It would change how we will manage uh, over all the life cycle of uh, this digital identification. I can talk about that, but not about the disposal. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if physical IDs are, are would be adding to the threat posed by digital IDs and all of that data. What there is an interplay there that where. If you have your physical IDs and you have your physical wallet, once you lose it, you know you've lost it. You know you need to go cancel your cards and everything else. You don't have that luxury with digital IDs because you won't know when it gets stolen. So that's the only interplay I can see between the two because your, your ID card that you have still has some information in there, um, but it, it won't exactly help them. Besides the information they already have when they steal your ID, I don't see how that can help them to break into your digital ID wallet uh, that should be secured. Now, I could be very wrong and they could find ways to do it, um, but I, I can't see a direct link right now. All right, we have time for one more question. And so I'm gonna ask everyone, cause it's a great question. Um, what makes you most excited for the advent of digital IDs and particularly as far as, far as remote convenience is concerned? So Melissa, most excited. Me first. <laughs> I think I'm just excited about the fact that I won't, if we have digital IDs and it's working well, and we have one identity because I'm one individual, then I won't need to remember all the user IDs and passwords and type them in all its different locations. So I'm excited about the convenience of digital identity. Layla? Uh, traveling, that's the first thing that, that comes to mind. And again, as, as terrified as I am of this idea that, you know, we might have AI facial recognition that tracks you as you walk through the airport. It, in my utopia, I'm imagining this as like a perfect non-biased solution that does track you as you walk. And I just enter the airport and I don't have to do anything. I, you know, you don't have to pay. You don't have to stop and like to pay for that chocolate you buy or anything. You just go onto your plane and you know where you're supposed to be. So that's what I'm imagining. I, I don't know if that's like sci-fi a little bit at this point, but I'm hoping that we are, we're, we could create a world like that where, where this works perfectly and we're safe and it's non-biased and it's very convenient. Excellent. Adriana? Uh, I think uh, from an organization perspective, maybe uh, getting away from managing different kinds of ideas. Like, you, you know, uh, that, that is one of the most complex uh, uh, management for organizations uh, today. So getting away from that, I think, would be uh, and, and uh, putting those resources available to do other things will be, uh, will be a great help. Hey, John. Yeah, so everybody covered everything. So I can just say that it would, if in Utopia, again, Leila, as you mentioned, if uh, there will be seamless authentication and I don't have to think about anything and it would just work so smooth that I don't see when it's happened. And just by having that seamless authentication system placed in every system, like going to banks and I don't know, in day on daily basis, we just need to authenticate ourselves. I have like three step authentication like three to four step uh, every week we have to do it in university like to get even into my outlook so that really bugs me like uh, because of security like you want to build security but it's so difficult to manage it and it's not seamless i think it's the convenience who don't love that everybody loves that <laughs> so for sure if it's seamless and we can trust completely then i'm up for it I love it. I know I went to Disney World many years ago now, but they had bands. If anyone's been there in the last decade, and then you get a band, you put your credit card on it, it opens your hotel room, it gets you onto rides, you can pay for food in the park. It is 
um, a great example of having all of your identity in one place. And um, if it's, I still don't trust the security and privacy behind it, uh, but it does give you convenience. So I totally agree. All right, so we're at time. So you can find us um, on the platform if you have more questions. I want to thank everyone on this panel. You guys have all been amazing. Thank you for your insight. Uh, and thank you for CyberX for hosting it. So thank you all very much. Thank you.